Look, um, I have to issue a viewer warning. Some viewers fi might find aspects of this presentation disturbing. While there's no violence, nudity or references to drug usage, there may be some commentary that might go a little close to the bone for some. But uh, I'm, at the, I'm at the blunt end of the basin plan and um, um, I want to give you an unashamedly um, user's perspective on the plan. Okay, we, we need some very quick context to, to understand um, uh, what, where I come from and, and the points that I'll make about um, the modernisation program. So Collie Irrigation is the fourth largest irrigation company in Australia. Um, it's without doubt the most modern and efficient open channel irrigation system in the country. If people want to pursue that, I, I can happy to do so. And its irrigators um, um, have, on average, more water entitlement than anywhere else in Australia. Um, Collie is its modernisation didn't happen overnight. It's it's been a 17-year uh, journey, um, and it's been a, both challenging and and rewarding. Um, in terms of where does Collie Ambly Irrigation sit in the context of the Basin Plan, uh, it subscribes to the views of the two irrigator peak bodies, New South Wales Irrigators Council and the National Irrigators Council that the basin plan that we've got was the least worst option that we were going to get and therefore we support the basin plan. Um, but it's bloody challenging, make no bones about it. And if you really want to know what it's like to be between a rock and a hard space, uh, come and be the CEO of an irrigation company in the basin because you have to spend a lot of your time negotiating with government and then you've got to go back and communicate what, what are sometimes disappointing outcomes, sometimes progress, to a, to a group of farmers who, who naturally see what's happening to them as a threat. Um, and then you've got the rest of the community who aren't irrigators but who depend on irrigation for their livelihood who also want you to, uh, to be their champion. So it's not for the faint hearted. But um, there is progress. Um, I suppose, though, um, I, we find ourselves almost in, a, in a, the perfect Bermuda Triangle, because you're not just dealing with the Basin Plan, you're dealing with a whole lot of industry reform, um, and you're dealing with a whole lot of government processes that are happening simultaneously. You've got Productivity Commission uh, inquiries, you've got Harper reviews, you've got ACCC, all over um, the water industry like, like a rash. Um, and there isn't a day where I don't log onto my computer to find yet another review is underway, yet another opportunity to comment. And, and, and yes, we've got, we're, we're being promised thorough consultation. And the last promise I got was two days ago, thorough consultation and our submission was required in 10 working days. So it's a, it's, a, it's a Bermuda Triangle and you just feel like you're being sucked deeper and deeper into, um, into the vortex. But there is progress. Okay, so um, this slide says that there's approximately 1,900. Um, David's put it, David Park, uh, perhaps has indicated it's 1,951, or sorry, David Glide's indicated 1,951 gigalitres of the 2750 recovered but I make the point that the remaining third will be harder to recover because the low hanging fruit's gone. Um, the, the easy projects have, have happened and whatever remains to be done in terms of modernisation will be a lot more expensive. And in one of the ironies of, of the whole arrangement, the fact that 1900 gigs has gone out of the, 1950 has gone out of the productive pool means that the price for recovering more gets higher. So um, the next third is going to be a lot harder um, than the first two thirds. Um, we've got a critical thing happening, um, supposed to be happening this year, and that's uh, agreement on a constraints manager across the, the basin states. Um, that's going to be um, a lot more problematic, I suspect, than uh, many people realise. And it will be interesting to see just how much agreement is actually reached. Um, we've got a raft of offset proposals whereby the 2750 can be, can be brought down if we can do smart things to recover, to, which mean that we don't have to, we can, envirom, we can water environmental targets more efficiently. Um, that's a really challenging proposition, but one that uh, everybody agrees is critical to landing 
the, place, the plan somewhere in a space where we can in fact declare that the triple bottom line has been met. There's a raft of policy measures and rule changes being contemplated that industry has very little visibility of. But the visibility that we've had so far suggests that there are not going to be any win-win outcomes. Um, now, bear in mind that one of the promises made by government is that they won't bring about changes, rule changes, if there are going to be third party impacts. So reconciling this question of no third party impacts um, with rule changes will be quite a challenge. There's still contention around whether or not some of the flow targets that are predicated in the plan actually can be met. Um, and in some cases, the MDBA has, has been um, gracious enough and intelligent enough to acknowledge that and has adjusted the flow regimes um, downwards because it's a recognition of the fact that what was being said locally was not just somebody dragging the chain, but it was a reality. And there's, but there's still a lot more work to be done in that respect. Um, Phillips talked about the work being done to understand the social and economic impacts. That's absolutely critical because if you don't understand the level of impact that the, that the plan has had thus far, you can't contemplate um, what the level of the remaining third is going to be, nor what, what the impact might be if you recovered an extra 450 gigalitres of water, uh, so-called upwater, um, uh, what, what that impact will be. And in fact, it's critical because that upwater can only be recovered if it can be shown to be um, uh, socially and economically neutral, at least. So how do, how do you actually make that declaration that it's going to be economically and socially neutral if you haven't yet understood the current level of uh, impact, uh, let alone getting to the 2750, let alone getting another 450 above that? Um, really, really critical stuff. Uh, and the, one of the answers that was given to me by a person in the department only a few weeks ago was that providing we get that water off willing, off farmers, providing we get it off farm and, and not out of an irrigation system, then that will, be, that will be the test. Well, I put it to you that just because a farmer is happy to hand that water over uh, doesn't necessarily mean that that's a net gain across an entire community. When you aggregate the loss of that extra water, it, it might tell you something different again. So this is really complex stuff. Uh, but progress is being made, and I say that quite sincerely. Um, uh, most recently, uh, we've had legislation which put a gap, would have put a, a ceiling on buyback. We've had uh, an amending bill um, before the upper house at the moment, which seeks to make a raft of changes that came out of a Water Act review, or review of the Water Act, and um, of the 24 odd recommendations, I think industry is very comfortable with about 23. So uh, that's progress. But um, Philip Glides made the point that the level of pain across the basin uh, communities um, does in fact vary. And uh, in some communities, the pain is, is very real and leaving that community to question whether or not they've got a future. Okay, so I now want to turn to the more fundamental question. Sorry. Of, uh, of uh, whether or not um, the, the public funding of modernisation, be, be it on farms or in irrigation or across irrigation systems, is smart or whether it's actually publicly funded large, yes. Um, and you've got to start off with the proposition that uh, what's the alternative? And the alternative is buyback. And there are people who strongly argue that the whole basin plan could have been done and dusted if the government had just gone and bought all the water back at market rates. So if you're an economic dry, um, uh, if you're a member of the Productivity Commission, this is great stuff. More buyback. If you're an a lot of environmentalists say, get on with it, just buy it back. Um, those people uh, then defend that argument by talking about alternate futures for the communities. Get it over and done with, 
because these communities have alternate futures. And when I asked some of these people what, uh, what the alternate future for, for the community of Collie Ambly, because its, it's a sole purpose is, is irrigation, everything hangs off it, I was told ecotourism. Now, I don't know, has any, any of you been there, any of you out there been to Collie Ambly? Okay, so you've got a pocket full of ecotourism dollars and you've got the opportunity to go to Kakadu, Great Barrier Reef, uh, go and swim with the whale sharks at Ningaloo, uh, or, or you're going to go to Collie Ambly to spend your ecotourism dollars. That's clearly patronising crap, um, and, and yet that's what people say to you. Or they talk about structural adjustment programs. Well, I don't know how many successful structural adjustment programs uh, you've seen, but I've seen very few. Typically what happens is somebody paints, you come in with the money, we paint the football shed, we put some heritage lights down the down the centre of the street, and that's a structural adjustment. Um, two, you know, three or four years later, you've got uh, one third less population admiring the streetscaping, uh, and then five years later, the town's virtually dead. It's really tough stuff, structural adjustment, and I put it to you that the most intelligent structural adjustment that um, can be had in the context of the Basin Plan is to invest in the sustainability of irrigation, because that's the future for those communities, not some um, half-assed notion of ecotourism or uh, we're going to give you new streetscaping. So um, we argue that public investment, this is the entire irrigation industry in the modernisation of government operated, uh, sorry, that in the modernisation of irrigation is the best form of structural adjustment. But it shouldn't just be seen as the modernisation of uh, on irrigation on farms or irrigation systems, it's got to be the modernisation of the entire system. The modernisation of the storages, the modernisation that allows you to have real-time um, information about what's happening in the river system, and the modernisation of the barrages down at South Australia so that those things don't take all day to, uh, to, to be adjusted. They can be adjusted in the same way that an irrigation scheme can be adjusted. So think about that modernisation across the whole system, because it is indeed a system. Oh, Philip um, made the point, Philip Glyde talked about uh, uh, the fellow in Cobram who had got a grant to modernise his irrigation system. I've got to tell you, Philip, it's not a grant, it's co-investment. That farmer handed back water, took took a valuable asset off his balance sheet, handed that back to the government, and the government provided him a two-tiered payment. First tier was for the market value of the water, and the second tier was a premium. That's a contribution to structural adjustment. This, these these, these so-called grants are misnamed. They should be seen as co-investment, because the owner of the water is investing the money that comes at the market value, that's his investment in the modernisation, and the, the premium is the government investment, which is by way of structural adjustment. It's a really important notion. It's offensive to irrigators and irrigation communities to be told that they're being sustained by grants. Um, Irrigation delivery systems need to be seen as nationally significant infrastructure. They contribute to the national wealth. They are the basis on which a whole range of communities exist. Uh, and, and increasingly, they're being used by government to affect the delivery of environmental water um, or to, in fact, deliver water on behalf of the state. The Collier Irrigation System is used to deliver water to irrigators well beyond Collie Ambly because that's the most efficient way to get that water to state water's customers. It means that state water can deliver water much more quickly and lose less water in the process. So increasingly, these are assets that are not just being used to service your own customers, but also to service other people's customers. Case study. Okay, in, in, in Collie, Collie Ambly, Every farm has been soil density, we've done soil density testing on every farm. So here's a schematic where you see um, brown and, and red soils, that's very sandy soil. Where you see green, it's heavier quality soil. 
um, where you see dark green, it's virtually clay. Every farm has been soil density tested. And so if you have farms with a whole lot of red or sand, you not only wouldn't grow rice on that farm, you're not permitted to grow rice on that farm. So this was the start of our sort of modernisation, was to investigate our soils, but also um, a 16 year uh, program with a minimal government investment, 16 million bucks, triggered $104 million co-investment to actually start improving um, the biodiversity in the local habitat and to produce more water efficient production. So it's a, that's the start of it. Um, but since 2003, we've been in the process uh, of returning water to the Commonwealth via a series of programs to modernise our irrigation system to the point now where a farmer can be anywhere in the world and if he's got an internet connection, he can control his water um, like that off his, over his iPad or his mobile phone, not touched by a human hand. Okay, so this, this is another sort of, world, this is world breaking stuff, first time, uh, done first time in Collie So a PhD student believes that you can map leaky channels by detecting changes in salinity. So basically hang a boom arm off uh, a four wheel drive vehicle, tow an array of sensors and he, can cover, he covered our entire system in the space of uh, about four weeks, detecting changes in salinity. Because the change in salinity detects, uh, is, a, is a subset of interaction between surface water and groundwater. So that, produced, that produces a map, um, a, a 3D image which shows you um, where you've got that interaction. And significantly, when we placed those two different systems, the soil density mapping and the salinity mapping over the top of each other, we got very, very close close correlations. That then tells us where we have to reline irrigation channels. All irrigation channels are lined. What happens is the lining breaks down over time. Typically in our case, 50 years old. So a lot of science, scientific effort um, to, to map it and a very high degree of correlation. To give you a sense of the scale of these things, this is our main canal. This is the, the process of relining. Uh, and they're not dinkies that we've uh, situated in the, their, their big earth moving equipment, so it's a big system. And there's some rubber lining, which is a different technology when you can't have access to, uh, to clay or you've got to cart it too far, so it becomes uneconomical. These are three, this is one set of three new sets of regulators we put in two years ago. This is under the modernisation program. Each one of those um, gates will allow 950 megalitres of water to pass through them a day. So this is large scale stuff. So um, in terms of a case study, modernising since 1999, we've produced water savings of approximately 60,000 megalitres per annum. We've reduced our staff by 30%. Farmers can access water in two hours rather than 24 hours. What's the significance of that? If you're a farmer, uh, and, you have, and you place your water order 24 hours notice and it rains, um, you're stuck with it. Um, conversely, two hour water ordering, you can be sitting off sweating, sweating, sweating. Is it gonna rain, is it gonna rain? Is the Bureau gonna get it right? Bureau gets it right, a uh, Bureau doesn't get it right, bang. I can get my water order on before my cross, uh, crop gets stressed. We've got peak flow rates onto farms which have gone from eight megs a day to up to some cases 100 megalitres a day. Fast watering is efficient watering. The process of getting a lot of water on and off a farm in back onto a recycle system means a plant can start growing again. Fast watering is the most efficient watering and this kind of modernisation has allowed us to leap forward. We've got a minimum level of supply across our entire system it has gone from eight megs a day. By the end of this winter, it'll be 14 megs a day. Um, and as I said, 24 seven access from anywhere in the world. That's the sort of modernization that is being funded under these co-investment arrangements. Um, I suppose in the absence of that kind of uh, modernization, um, Collier Irrigation, which is New South Wales' newest town, would have been its uh, most short lived town. Uh, you know, we, we recognise that you can't stay in the game of irrigation now if you're burning water. There's too much pressure 
on the resource for a start, and the resource is too valuable not to be using it to, to, to best effect and in the smartest possible way. So basically, smart water recovery provides the, the basis for a sustainable industry and sustainable communities, and it's about the most meaningful form of structural adjustment that government um, uh, can be in. So little wonder that there's a lot of interest in, in how we're going about this internationally. And that's just not interested in the basin plan. I mean, I'm hosting international delegations every month from all over the world, uh, including uh, countries uh, from the former Soviet Union. So there is huge interest in this modernisation and in the basin plan itself. Uh, this is the best possible way of achieving a balanced basin plan and, and, the, and the much promised triple bottom line. So I hope for those people that uh, reckon that buyback is the way to go and we should have stopped mucking around with this kind of stuff. Um, that's a very blunt instrument that just simply leaves communities, basic communities devastated. Um, and, and then it means that you know, the whole bunch of consultants will be able to go around and get a whole lot of government money and do studies about alternate futures only to find out that there's bugger all alternate futures for most of these communities. The future is sustainable irrigated agriculture. Thank you.